Hey everybody here on YouTube, uh, I'm Eric Tivers. Above me is Roberto Olivardia. We are about to hit record for the audio for the podcast. We're gonna be talking about ADHD and OCD. So Roberto, are you ready? I'm ready. All right, we're gonna begin here in five, four, three, two, one. ADHD Rewired episode 149. This is the show designed for those of us with really good intentions, but a slightly wandering attention. My name is Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, coach, and speaker. The website is ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Today's guest is someone who you may be familiar with by now because I think he is the uh, the largest repeat offender as far as guests on this podcast. Uh, he's been ta- been on the, the show before talking about um, bipolar disorder, talking about uh, eating disorders, talking yep. about sleep, and then um, a couple weeks ago when we saw uh, when we were at the chat conference, he was talking about how he almost stole a, a, a motorcycle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Ten years old. Um, it, so our guest today is Dr. Roberto Alavardia. Uh, Roberto is a is a, a psychologist from Harvard. Um, I'm not even reading your bio. If you want to fill anything else in, please feel free to do so. Yes, I'm a clinical psychologist, uh, an instructor in the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, and I have a private practice in Lexington, Massachusetts, and I specialize in. ADHD, as well as OCD, um, eating disorders in boys and men, um, people with body dysmorphic disorder, bipolar disorder. So I see, and particularly with my ADHD patients, um, a lot, my typical ADHD patient is someone who also has a comorbid disorder of, of one of the ones that I just listed. So, and I'm very happy to be a repeat offender, Eric. Um, so I'm always happy to be here chatting with you. So, you know, I often tell sort of consumers of mental health services to, if you run into a, a therapist or, or clinician of any kind that says they specialize in like more than like four or five things, be very wary. <laughs> But you are, you know, you're, I think, the exception to that rule. Like every time I talk to you about, you know, tough clients that I'm, that I'm working with, you just have this you're just like wealth of really deep information um, and, and have these experiences. I mean, you work with some really challenging clients. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm really excited to, to have you on to be able to pick your brain um, and to talk today specifically about OCD and ADHD. Yes. Um, so, you know, we've, we've seen these, you know, the, maybe the internet memes that say, you know, I'm completely rigid and obsessed with my, my productivity system until I get bored of it. And then I move on. Yeah. So let's talk about sort of the, 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 the basics from the, the, how often, how frequently does OCD and ADHD uh, coexist together? Sure. So it's actually one of the most uh, misunderstood comorbidities because we think of ADD the ADD personality and the OCD personality as being two completely separate individuals. So unlike any of the other comorbid issues that I I speak with, the one that surprises people the most is, oh, you can have ADHD and OCD. And we don't know what percentage of people with ADHD have OCD. There haven't been any strong studies. Mm. However, there have been a number of studies done looking at samples and populations of people with OCD, and they find that 30% of people with OCD also have ADHD. So one third of people with OCD have ADHD, which makes it a very, very strong comorbid relationship. And of the patients that I see, um, a lot of times one of those will, it's usually the ADD actually that often gets undiagnosed. Um, Although I have worked with people with ADHD that turned out to have undiagnosed OCD as well. And I think what also makes it tricky is that a lot of times when people have both, they, often can have this sort of what, that kind of whack-a-mole phenomenon that when the OCD is quite severe, the ADD is sort of kind of tucked away and in the shadows. So you might not see it as much. However, when the OCD starts getting better, it becomes more evident the impulsivity and the executive function issues that um, you see with the ADHD. So sometimes anxiety in general or OCD can almost mitigate some of the things that um, you might see with people with ADHD. So it's much more common than people think it is. 
So let's talk about maybe first dispelling some of the myths about what OCD is. Um, Because I think there, I mean, the more that I've learned about OCD, um, the more I've been surprised about what, you know, which is not surprising when we think about, you know, when we are, we take what's the, the, the uneducated person's view of ADHD and then what is ADHD actually, right? Yes. There's a huge disparity between those two things. Absolutely. Right? I, I think that OCD, especially in sort of the, the public discourse and, and, and sort of pop psychology, it's one of those, you know, just like the, some, sometimes people use the term ADHD is like, oh, we're all ADD. You know, it's like, no, you know, we're right. not. It's like, and we're also not so OCD, even though it's, it's often used in sort of that way to mean sort of like anally retentively organized. Yes, absolutely. No, that, and, and I would say, I mean, my OCD patients get, um, are, are very, get very offended by that sort of terminology because OCD is I have to say a very tormenting disorder. It's, it's one of the most tormenting disorders when you are riddled with um, obsessions and compulsions. So what we mean by an obsession is an intrusive thought. So it's not a thought that you want. It's an intrusive thought that you cannot get out of your mind. It produces a tremendous amount of anxiety. It makes it very difficult to do anything else when you have this thought. And there's a level of irrationality to the thought, but and you kind of know that, but at the same time, it doesn't matter. So an obsessive thought could be, if you see the word breast cancer and someone in your family is going to get breast cancer. Now we know that if we see the word cancer, well, that someone can't magically then just get cancer, but it almost doesn't matter. Your body's hijacked by all of this anxiety. And so now you could still get the diagnosis of OCD with just having the obsessions, those obsessions. However, for most people, the only way to relieve that anxiety, the only way to neutralize that anxiety is by performing a ritual or a behavior. It could be a mental ritual is what we call a compulsion. And so compulsions are really designed to just rid the anxiety. Now, the, the logic behind what to do as a compulsion, it almost, it doesn't matter. I mean, I've had some patients that say, I don't know, like my brain just told me I have to pray. I have to say the Our Father prayer 15 times. Why 15? I don't know. And they talk in OCD, they speak, they sort of refer to it as the just right feeling. Like that's mm. just, that's just what makes the anxiety go away. So it must be the thing that I have to do. And then with OCD, what happens is that you pray 15 times, no one in your family gets breast cancer, and then it produces what's called a magical thinking and this sort of relationship that says, okay, now again, keep in mind that these people know like that's, that doesn't make sense, but at the same time, their bodies are saying otherwise. So then it keeps the compulsion going. Mm -hmm. Now what happens if you don't do the compulsion is now you suddenly feel this unbearable weight and burden that now you are going to directly be responsible, in this case, with this form of OCD, of causing cancer to a family member. How horrible is that? Now, OCD can come in so many different forms. The one that's most um, known in Hollywood is contamination fears, uh, germaphobes, and things like that. Um, but again, we're not talking about people who sanitize their hands every hour or the person that you know might put a paper towel to shut off the bathroom faucet. Many of us might do that, you know, in public, public restrooms. Um, I'm talking about individuals who um, sometimes cannot leave their house because the idea of touching anything that somebody else has, has touched, um, that they wash their hands four hours a day, um, and the whole time, I mean, knowing like, okay, I just washed them, but what if, and this is where that obsessional thought, what if there's some contaminant on my hands and it causes harm to other people or it causes my own death, but OCD could be fears of going to hell, fears um, that you've harmed somebody, um, sexual and, and violent intrusive thoughts. So. Uh, I have a patient I'm working with now who has this violent intrusive thought that he's going to stab somebody. Now, this is not someone who's homicidal. This is not someone who would ever, ever commit. I mean, that's the irony is that these patients would never do such a thing. And that's what makes that thought so horrible to them. But see, for someone without OCD, we might have those same thoughts of like, oh, like, 
I'm, I'm running late. I just want to run over this person so I get to work on time. But we know we're not going to really do that. Now, to some of my patients with OCD, when they have a thought like that, they think, oh my gosh, that is so unacceptable. That is horrible that I had that thought. I must really be a terrible person. Have you found it for, for your patients normalizing when you explain that most people will have sort of weird thoughts like that? Because it's true. I think most people do have weird thoughts like that. Where they recognize, oh, yeah. like, let's, you know, yeah, I'd love to just run over this person so I can get to, to where I'm going. Like, we, but we know that that's an absurd thought, and it just does not, it doesn't create a, a distressing experience after that. Exactly. It, it, it's certainly part of the work, but unfortunately, at least at the beginning of treatment, it doesn't really help them because, A, they either don't really believe it, or B, they say, well, maybe for you, you won't, wouldn't really do that. But how do I know? And so this patient of mine who has this fear of stabbing, you know, someone, he will not use utensils. At first, he would not cut his food with a knife in the presence of anyone because wow. he would have this intrusive image because it could also be an image it doesn't have to just be a thought it could be a picture in your mind that he would take that knife and just stab who who's ever is next to him then it would be he couldn't an ocd always gets worse before unless you get treatment it, it is not something that is contained and a mm. lot of my patients think that it will be and then and for him he's a good example of this where then even if he was in a room alone if he was cutting his meat wherever the knife, whatever direction that knife was pointing to, he then thought somehow that that person could be harmed by it. Now, this is not psychosis. This is not, he knows that there's an irrationality to it, but he is so anxious of the idea of like, what if I cause harm to someone? And is that one of the distinguishing uh, features that, he, that the person knows that it's, it's irrational? Yeah, that yes, that there's often this element of like, I know it might not make sense, or I know it's irrational, but it, it gets to a point where it doesn't matter, because you're just feeling that kind of nervousness that and that extreme level of anxiety. And the fact that when you do the compulsion, and the compulsion can sometimes be avoidance, so OCD breeds itself on avoidance. So in his case, his he didn't really have any compulsions. He would sort of engage in what we call avoidant behavior, whereas he would stop using utensils. So he would start eating meat with his hands as opposed to with a knife, even in like public restaurants and things like that, for fear that he shouldn't have a knife in his hand. Now, when I hear you say, you know, avoidance, I also think about ADHD and procrastination. Mm -hmm. Is there an overlap uh, with, with, with work-related issues, uh, you know, avoidance um, uh, with OCD? Yeah, so when people have both, it could be, uh, the, the first thing I do when I have, work with someone who has both is really teasing out what's the OCD, what's the ADD. And um, interestingly, with most of my patients, even young ones that I work with who have both, they can, they're pretty good at knowing this is the ADD versus this is the OCD. Mm. So I'm avoiding this task of writing this paper because I know when I write the paper, I have to write something like five times before I, it can be on, on, on paper. Um, if I don't do it five times, I'm going I, to not do well on the paper, for example. Or I don't want to read that because I have to reread it. 10 times, not because their comprehension is poor, not because they have dyslexia, but it's because their brain is telling them, if you don't do that in tens or in a multiple of seven or whatnot, something bad is going to happen um, to someone. So does it always have to be so sort of specific and ritualized, the behavior? With OCD, usually there um, is a certain fear, but sometimes it's not even like with some of my patients, I might say, what do you fear will happen if you don't do that? And they'll say, I don't know. And a lot of times, I mean, what OCD ultimately really is, is someone who has an extreme fear of uncertainty and really a fear of anxiety, like a feeling anxious, you know, it's almost kind of, so they're trying to neutralize themselves from really feeling anxious. But you'll often find these personality characteristics of um, a high degree of hyper responsibility amongst people with OCD. And um, so sometimes how it might intersect with ADD is now you have people that really have this kind of almost um, these principles of getting things done well. And now when their ADD makes it difficult, let's say, to get things done, now they feel really bad um, because their executive functions might not be in the place 
to sort of get those things done, but their OCD is saying, well, to be a good person, I need to do X, Y, and Z. But no, it doesn't always have to be this. Sometimes patients are like, I don't know what, what the, the fear is. I just fear just that feeling. I don't want that feeling. You know, when, when I hear you say that, um, you know, one of the things, and, and I, I think it was about a year or two ago, I, I, I sent you a text message. I'm like, Roberto, I think we need to talk about uh, ADHD and OCD, and this isn't about a client. Um, <laughs> but I think I just had, I had uh, finished listening to um, um, uh, Thomas Brown's Smart But Stuck, and he has a, in there a vignette about a, a, a client of his who has ADHD and OCD, and it just resonated so like strongly with me. Mm. And, you know, I I have certain ideas about OCD. In my, you know, just I don't specialize in that, right? Um, and I think it's more than just the the you know the locking the door, checking the stove, and that kind of stuff. But um, so I'm familiar with the ruminations. But um, he in this the vignette in this book is talking a lot about um, sort of workaholism and mm. perfectionism. And you know, I I self-identify as a perfectionist in recovery because mm-hmm. uh, it's something that I really, uh, and this is also through the work of, of uh, Brene Brown, where she has these, these uh, 10 guideposts for wholehearted living. And, and one of her guideposts that um, really was a punch in the gut to me when I heard her say this, because it was like, I was looking at myself in a mirror that was really clear and I hadn't realized it before. And mm-hmm. it was that we have to let go of productivity as a measure of our self-worth. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Damn, like she just hit the nail right on the head. So I like to say I got, I got punched in the gut by Brene Brown, um, <laughs> which has been really important in my in my work. But it's it's I used to have this sort of thought: like, is there an element of OCD uh, in that my, my work? You know, so I look at um, the is it an executive functioning challenge where I have that, and I call it the, the real bad case of one more thing itis. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right, and where's that fine line between, you know, um, uh, wanting to deliver excellence as a sort of a value yeah. that I have and right. perfectionism? So um, maybe you can help sort of help me sort of weed these things out a little bit. Absolutely. So first, I would recommend a book that a colleague of mine, uh, his name is Dr. Jeff Shamansky. It's S Z Y M A N S K I, and he, I did. Uh, I did all my training at McLean Hospital, which is a psychiatric hospital um, here in the Boston area, very well-renowned hospital. And my major rotation was in the uh, OCD Institute, which is a residential program for severe uh, treatment-resistant patients with OCD who come from all over the world um, who are severely impaired by OCD. So my training has been with you know, these very, very complex, very tough cases of OCD. And Jeff um, is now, he trained there as well and, and worked there. And now he's the director of the International OCD Foundation, which I, I would also direct people to their website there. They are the umbrella organization for OCD, fantastic organization. But he wrote a book called The Perfectionist Handbook. Oh. And it's a wonderful <laughs> It's a great book because he, what I liked about his, his book is that he proclaims himself as, as someone who has these issues and how to tease through the pursuit of excellence, as you were mentioning, the pursuit of, of being an ambitious person and being that perfectionist. And I find, you know, even in my own experience, like there, ha- I can be perfectionistic about certain things. And I would say for me, most of it is driven by my ADD versus I, I am not absent of obsessive compulsive um, behaviors in certain times in my life where it's really been more than a behavior. It's been hit really hard. And, um, but a lot of times, like I think with ADD, and this is something that often can get misdiagnosed, is that so with OCD, you have sometimes this um, specificity or this precision of how something needs to be because it's satisfying either a certain ritual or a certain rule to um, really reduce anxiety. So I need to do it this way because I'll get anxious if it goes some other way. Now for ADD, you'll often see a high level of specificity, but not because of anxiety, but because it actually boosts your executive functions. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, I, and I'm not kidding when I say this, like this, this 
pen right here. It's, I'm <laughs> giving free advertising to Uniball pen. These are the best pens. I am very specific about the pen that I use because I will be more productive writing with this pen than I will a pen that doesn't glide on the paper as well. So very like textural, very sensory related things, which a lot of people with ADD can point to in terms of the clothing that they mm -hmm. wear. And, and the, I am very specific about how my bedroom is in terms of the temperature of the room. When we talked about sleep um, in your previous podcast, I have struggled with sleep disorders and everything. So the temperature of the room, the, the, the bed sheets that I use, the way my pillow is, all are specific, but not because it, it, it's just so or because I'd be anxious, but because I really will not sleep. If, if those things are off, you know, in mm -hmm. some ways, my body is just sort of, so that's definitely more, um, I look at it as kind of like my nervous system and my ADD. Um, I used to clean my room in college before writing a paper. Now my room would be a mess at any other time, but you always knew when I had a paper due because it would be meticulous. I mean, to the point where I would take a toothbrush and like a mirror, I'd be like getting dust, two tips of dust, you know, off the mirror. And my friends would be like, oh, you're so OCD. And I, and I never related to that. I said, no, I'm basically taking any distraction away and I'm procrastinating. Yeah, because I used to do that too. And I, I refer to that as pseudo productivity. Yes. It's like, yes, this stuff is important, but it's actually just delaying the more important challenging task ahead of you. Absolutely. And, and I didn't care about how much dust was on my mirror when I wasn't writing a paper. So I didn't have this value of like, um, you know, that level of, clean, you know, I always have the value of cleanliness, but not to that level. Um, however, there have been other times in my life where my head can get into a very obsessional mode. And I can, I can relate in the sense that when your anxiety sometimes gets so high, Sometimes OCD becomes like the way of saying, okay, well, I can control this. Like this thought that I have, which is I don't have any control over, it's harder sometimes to sort of sit with the fact that you just don't have control over things. And OCD, it's almost like the kind of um, the frenemy, you know, that it sort of in, is inviting because it's saying, well, if all you do is if you have to pray or if you have to count things in sevens or if you have to just, you know, think of a different thought and you now have control over that, it's very appealing. I mean, there's something that can be very appealing to people initially. What happens, of course, is that that frenemy turns out to be you know, Satan. And it's very greedy and always wants more, right? right? Absolutely. That beast is going to take more and more, and it's, um, it can be very, very debilitating. Um, but I, as a kid, I mean, I didn't use, I don't think I've ever said this publicly. I've never used, I didn't use a public bathroom until I was 14 years old. Like, I never went to the bathroom in school. I never went, and the idea, even now, the idea of a public bathroom kind of skeeves me out. I mean, it's sort of, but I use them now. But when I was a kid, I was like, well, why do I have to use it? And, and in my head, it's because now this is, I think, where the ADD also can play a part. And I've seen this in patients. I have such a vivid visual imagination, like very, very vivid. And it has worked in my favor through most things in my life. This is where it does not. I picture what people are doing in these public bathrooms and the number of people that are doing it in that bathroom. And it disgusted me when I was a kid. <laughs> and the only thing that helped was I was in an amusement park and I had to go to the bathroom. And I remember it was an hour and a half away from my house. And I said to my brother, I'm like, we have to go home. Like I just ate really bad pizza and I have to go to the bathroom. And he's like, um, we're not, we're an hour and a half away. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, just use the bathroom here. And I'm like, and I said, I've never used a public bathroom. And he was shocked. He was like, how have you gone all these years without using a public restroom? So that very much to me was, you know, I think the ADD played a part, but it was very driven by this sort of obsessionality around like, oh, like, and, but the ADD also plays a part too, because those thoughts are so distracting. And, and it's hard for people with OCD who don't have ADD, Part of what makes it is what we know cognitively about people with OCD is it's very hard for them to shift out of those thoughts that many of us, again, might have. Like if I asked you to visualize hundreds of people using a public restroom, it would probably it's go, awful. Yeah, it's probably going to repulse you. But, but most people can be like, yeah, and, and the thought just ebbs and flows. Mm -hmm. For people with OCD, they're stuck on it. You know, they, it's almost like a hyper-focus. 
Exactly. And, and I find with people with ADD and OCD, that hyper-focus works against them mm. with their OCD. Because one of the things that makes it also very important, of course, for diagnosis in terms of treatment, when we're talking medication, many of my patients who have OCD and ADD cannot take stimulant medication mm. for their ADD. It makes their OCD worse because they're better able to focus on their obsessions, which is not what they want to do. Okay. So it's not enabling them to move out of the obsessions and think they're actually saying, I feel more anxious because I am now thinking more clearly about this horrible you know, thing, or I'm thinking more clearly about um, going back to where I think I might've offended someone and actually thinking it through, I probably did offend them and maybe because the, OCD is also, you know, the disease of doubt, you know, that even when someone says, I probably didn't offend them, but maybe did I? And you sort of, or did I lock the door? Now for people with ADD, maybe you really didn't lock the door. Um, and, you know, many people with ADD can look OCD because they might check, 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 but it's often because people with ADD have poor working memory, right. have left the house sometimes, leaving all the lights on and everything. Very different than someone with OCD who can say, okay, I've locked the door. I know I've locked the door. They never have not locked the door. And then they go to work and they commute to work for 45 minutes and the anxiety is so high that they'll drive home to check. And of course they have locked the door. Um, is it like that it doesn't register in the brain that it happened? Yeah, what happens is that the, the doubt comes in because see, with something like locking a door, we shouldn't remember that we lock the door because it's an ordinary everyday event. So mm -hmm. if I asked you, for example, do you remember, you know, do you remember locking your door? Like, do I remember locking my car, you know, this morning? No, but if you asked me if I did it, I would say, yeah, I did it because that's what I always do. Like I get out of my car, mm -hmm. I have a little button on my keychain, and it's just, it's just habit. So my, there's no need for my memory to take to basically use any RAM in my memory to remember that. That's not an ordinary event. Now, for someone with OCD, the absence of remembering now means, well, maybe I didn't lock it. And mm -hmm. if I didn't lock it, now someone could break into the car. And if someone breaks into the car, then da, 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 and then the thoughts can really, you know, escalate. The, the what if monster grows and grows. Right. So with OCD, it's, it's, a, it's a disorder of possibility rather than probability. You know, mm -hmm. if, you're, if, if you're telling someone the probability of that happening, that doesn't matter. It's almost like the brain rests on the possibility. So it's very black and white thinking then. Very black and white. Because how do you know that I won't stab somebody? Like, how do you know that? This is what my patients ask me. Like, you, you're not in my head. Like, how? Is there a possibility? Now, if I'm honest, sure, there's a possibility that you could stab somebody, but we, we can't, we don't live life on possibilities for most things, certain things, you know, we do, um, but we really li live them on, on probabilities. So the treatment for OCD really is ex what we call exposure and response prevention treatment. It is the gold standard. Medication can be helpful. And, and I have to say also, I do have OCD ADD patients that can take stimulants, and sometimes the stimulants can help the OCD. If the OCD we find is triggered sometimes by the executive dysfunction or the chaos that ADD sometimes can bring people, um, but if someone is medicated for the OCD, which are the SSRIs like Prozac and Zoloft, they still need the behavioral therapy. At the end of the day, you're not going to get over that sort of OCD thing until you have put yourself in a situation where you're exposing yourself to it and find out that your feared response actually doesn't happen. So for this patient, and this is gonna sound very bizarre to some of your listeners um, who don't know much about OCD treatment, um, the last session I had actually with this patient, we were sitting side by side and he had a knife to my throat. What we're gonna do right there, we're, this is a great time to take a break because <laughs> of course we wanna know what happened next. All right, so we're gonna take a quick break and we will come right back and uh, and for the youtubers who are watching this since i don't edit this and add my kind of promos and stuff um 
definitely subscribe to the podcast. I can go to ADHDrewired.com to learn more about what we do on the podcast. And depending on when you're watching this, you might want to also check out our one of our upcoming coaching groups. If you go to coachingrewired.com, uh, we do typically four groups a year. Um, and if you're watching this shortly after this comes out, uh, right now it's December 14th as I'm recording this. I'm not even sure when this is going to be released because I haven't planned that far ahead yet. Because um, yes, I do have ADHD and I'm not looking directly at my calendar at the moment. Um, go to coachingrewired.com if you are interested in learning more about our group coaching program. Um, and now we're going to come back. So if you listen to this on the uh, podcast, you won't hear this part. This was just for you, YouTubers. All right. Exclusive. Exclusive. <laughs> All right. All right, and we are back. So right before the break, you were telling us that you had a client that had a, uh, basically, you were sitting right next to him, had a knife to your throat. Yes, cliffhanger. Yes, and this, is, this was part of our exposure plan. So because he was avoiding knives, and then it became avoiding scissors, it became avoiding any, because think about it, you could stab someone with anything. Um, and so it got to a point where he couldn't, he couldn't hold keys because what if he stabbed somebody with it? Um, and again, most sensitive, wonderful, empathic soul. I mean, wonderful person. So the uh, exposure would be first, we would have therapy sessions and he would just hold a knife just, you know, across from me. Now we're at the point of a hierarchy that you create um, the clinician and the, and the client and he's literally holding it to my throat. Now, if he truly was someone who could just stab, you know, someone okay, it's going to happen. Now, clearly I have a lot of faith that he's not going to do that. Um, but he's thinking, how do I know? So for 50 minutes, we're talking and his hand, you know, might be a little shaky. But what happens with exposure therapy is anxiety is something, if you are actually mindful and connected to your anxiety, what goes up must come down. Yes. Now, if we avoid our anxiety back and forth, it can, that can, that has a life that can go for years and years and years and years and years. It's never ending. But if you're actually sitting and tolerating the anxiety, it will go down because our body is not designed to pump out cortisol and adrenaline in these long-term you know, bursts. It just doesn't, it, and what happens is that once the body sort of is depleted of all of that anxious energy, the brain starts catching on, well, this can't be a threat because I would feel really nervous. I would feel really anxious if it was. And sure enough, after 50 minutes, he was like, hmm, you know, I, I, in his, and I would ask throughout the time, what's your, what we call a suds level, your subjective units of distress on a scale of one to 10. And it would be, you know, nine, 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 10, 10, 10, 10. But then even within 50 minutes, it got down to like a seven. And it's like, okay, so we're going to do it again. And we're going to do it again. And we're going to do it again. And we're just going to keep doing it. And this is, he had OCD in another area before that totally we got through and this one sort of popped up and that can happen sometimes and sometimes it, it doesn't happen. But it's, um, it, it's the great thing about exposure therapy and I find this, you know, when I talk about like medication for ADD, it's the same idea. It's like, it's amazing how effective it can be for, um, but with exposure therapy, the thing I hear most from patients when they do it and they do really well with it, it's like, oh my gosh, I wish I did this so many years ago. Like there's a real grieving process that goes on with a lot of people with OCD who are riddled by their OCD and tortured by it for mm -hmm. you know, many years. But there's also a lot of myths around it. I mean, people think, oh, all OCD people are clean and all OCD people are, OCD can come in so many different ways. So to give you another example of someone with OCD and ADD, I worked with someone who came in diagnosed with ADD and their you know, work would always be very careless and would make a lot of impulsive errors. And then one day it was clear that something else was going on and I was trying to sort of get at it. And, and um, the, the, the boy that I was working with, he said, well, sometimes I'm not making those errors out of carelessness. And I said, what do you mean? And he goes, well, I, don't want anyone to ever think I'm cheating. And again, so you hear often these like virtues that get almost um, like they go, it's like being virtuous, like gone awry, you know, in a way, sort of like what perfectionism is. It's this pursuit of excellence gone awry. Um, and he said, I don't want to ever cheat. 
And so sometimes I purposely write the wrong answer so no one thinks I cheated. And he wasn't just saying this. And, and sure enough, like he'll show how sometimes he has to misspell something or get the year wrong or whatever. And I said, well, what would happen if he, and he says, if I cheated, or even if someone thinks I cheated, even if I know I didn't cheat, he goes, I'll start to wonder, did I cheat? Like, did I get the right answer by looking at the person's paper next to me? And if I did, that's really bad, and I'm going to go to hell. And so mm -hmm. if, he didn't, if he wrote the wrong answer, that neutralized the anxiety. If he wrote the right answer, which he would do sometimes, he would have to pray and say these certain words in his head, these like, it's just these collection of words that for whatever reason his OCD dictated to him. And this was huge. And then sure enough, we found out that up to 60% of what was marked and looked at as his ADD impulsivity carelessness in his work was his OCD. Wow. Which this poor kid had been struggling with for three years and told no one about it. He thought it was the most bizarre thing. He thought people would think he was afraid he'd be locked up. Like he thought he was crazy. How old was, how old was he? He's 16 now. He was 13 when this started. Mm. And he said he remembers the day it started. That the day it started is he said, huh, like, did I, how did, he, he was surprised that he got the right answer at some math problem. And he said, how did I get that right? And then he said it was almost like, not a psych, caught thought but it was almost like a thought that said did you cheat you know like you know almost like someone might just jokingly ask themselves like did you cheat or did you get this or did you and he thought oh my gosh that would be and then he said it felt as if somebody just punched him in the stomach and said that would be really bad if you cheated that that's awful if you did that I know when I've heard of the, uh, sort of that sudden onset of OCD type symptoms, um, you know, I, I've read and heard about things regarding uh, PANDAS. I, I, are you yeah. familiar with that? Yep, absolutely. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So PANDAS is, it's very, um, I, I've treated a couple of patients with it and it's a very, it's basically caused by um, a structural streptococcal that like a stress it's bacteria. Hard it's a hard word to say um a struck bacteria so people who have no history of ocd they might not even have a family history of ocd develop um and, and i don't want to alarm people that every time their child gets strep throat that they're going to suddenly have this it, we don't it, it is a very specific strain but after they get this strep bacteria literally overnight they develop OCD. And um, there are, I mean, at McLean, I have colleagues at the OCD um, Institute, the International OCD Foundation, that, are, um, that have specific forums and groups trying to address that. In terms of treatment, it's pretty much the same. I mean, in terms of the exposure therapy and, and whatnot, um, but that is, it's very sudden. It's not, whereas with people with OCD and kids and teenagers that I work with, adults that I work with, can trace back many, many years. It mm. might not have been always an impairment, but parents will say, oh, I remember that he would get distressed if his sneakers weren't lined up a certain way, or that, um, you know, if, uh, if somebody didn't come home at a certain time, that it was more than just like the typical anxiety that a kid might have, that there was like his head would go into sort of a different place with it. With pandas, People don't have those experiences a lot of times, you know, way back, and it, and it happens overnight, and it's really hard for people to wrap their heads around. So I want to ask you about um, both uh, OCPD, obsessive compulsive personality uh, disorder, yes. and um, sort of high-functioning autism or Asperger's syndrome. Um, yeah. So I want to first talk about OCPD, so obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Um, yes. I know that, that it, which is very different from... Very different. Yeah. Will you just talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. And I'm glad you brought that up because OCPD or obsessive compulsive personality disorder is marked by um, individuals who are quite rigid, can, quite inflexible, uh, have a very painfully sometimes hard time making decisions, very perfectionistic, sometimes quite narcissistic in the sense that they, unlike OCD, which is a very distressing, it's e what we call ego dystonic. There's nothing that people with OCD like about having OCD. They, mm -hmm. they, um, with OCPD, it's very ego syntonic. So the person with OCPD will say, I don't know why everybody isn't doing it 
the way that I do it. Mm. With OCPD, you're almost obsessed with efficiency. Um, they have very high moral values against waste, against um, the lack of productivity. They can actually sometimes look down on people who are not particularly productive. They um, often fall into workaholism. And, and okay, you're making me a little uncomfortable here, Roberto. <laughs> <laughs> and, and hyper productivity, but not because, unlike the person with ADD, when you're talking about workaholism, that I can fall into that. But I sincerely, and I and I'm I'm sure I can say the same about you, Eric. That we love what we do. Like, yes, I love going to work every day, and I love coming home from work and seeing my family every day. I, I feel so blessed that I feel passionate about what I do. And people with ADD, one of the benefits that I've always felt about having ADHD is I have to do something that I love. Yes. Like I just, I, I would literally, and I have proven this with odd jobs in my past, be rendered dysfunctional. And, it's not that I, you know, and I'm not even being dramatic when I say that. I mean, things that are boring. So, but I love it. Like I, I am, I want to take on this project and this project because, um, because I genuinely love it. It's just nourishing to me. Now, the person with OCPD actually often is miserable at the work that they're doing. Mm, they, they, okay. they would not feel, they don't feel passion. Um, in fact, a lot of people with OCPD really don't have um, a lot of access to their emotions. You know, they kind of think, from the neck up, we sort of say, like they're very heady and mm. very cerebral. So it's almost like, um, now I've seen a lot of people, for example, I treat men and boys with anorexia, and I've seen that comorbidity of anorexia and OCPD of individuals who have said to me, where it's not a body image thing, they don't have a fear of fatness, they'll say, well, if I could survive eating this little amount of food, then clearly this is all I need to eat. So they're basing sort of, mm. this is how I'm determining what I should eat. And if I eat any more, that's gluttonous. Like, and it's not, again, about I'm going to get fat. It's that this value, this moral failing around, well, that's gluttonous. That's what disgusting people do. Like, and why should I have to do that if I don't need to do that? And this was once said to me by a man who's six feet, 90 pounds, at wow. six feet tall. And he said he took evidence of the fact that he could still work and he wasn't fainting that clearly that's all he needed to eat. And it wasn't, again, there was no body image thing. And, and he felt that anyone, that everybody else was wrong in, in that way. Now, mm. you brought up the autism spectrum disorders, which you'll often see that comorbidity of OCPD with, with autism spectrum, with that rigidity, that inflexibility. And part of that is a nature of being on the autistic spectrum, that it's just very difficult for them to even... Um, sometimes think in abstract ways that that concrete and productivity or when you know getting any kind of feedback is very important to people you know who are on the on the spectrum in, in that way with someone who's more on the OCPD without the autism um, that the feedback could be important but sometimes even if the feedback is negative to them they can often develop again these narcissistic ways of like oh well they don't they don't know what good work is like this is good work well it's interesting because you know with with uh, you know asperger's or autism part of the impairment is a difficulty with actually thinking about things through somebody else's perspective exactly right? and so when you talk about ocpd as being a very um uh, ego um what, what was the word you use ego ego syntonic ego, ego yeah. syntonic um you know, as a social worker, we didn't learn those, those fancy kind of words. <laughs> um, it sounds very Freudian. I don't know. Um, yeah. so, so, it, so in some ways, I mean, the, the person with Asperger's or autism is very sort of egocentric, but not in like, in I think the way that we sort of typically think about it, it's more right. in the way of the social mind isn't really able to think at least in an in a intuitive way. Right. Um, well, how somebody else might be thinking about this. So the idea that this is how it should be done and everybody else should do it, it seems on the, for the person with autism would seem to be more of the of a what we would refer to as challenges with theory of mind, the, the yes. ability to see something from somebody else's point of view. Um, so I, so it's just you know it's, it's an interesting sort of uh, uh, thought to, to sort of ponder because um, I you know I usually view as someone with with uh, with. Asperger's or, or autism, and that like sort of OCD is sort of part of the picture, but it almost sounds more like OCPD. 
Yes, oftentimes it is OCPD more than it is an OCD because with OCD, there are specific obsessions and specific compulsions and rituals and a tremendous amount of anxiety. With OCPD, um, some of my OCD PD patients are anxious, but a lot of them are not, they only get anxious when they feel that somebody is trying to sort of change the way they do something. So they could be obsessed with orderliness, Mm -hmm. not because, not in the same way that someone with OCD, like something bad will happen, but because they really feel this is the right way to do something. People with OCPD are wedded to the, there's a right and there's a wrong, which Again, you know, that, that sort of that line, you start to wonder, is this someone on that kind of spectrum? And some of my patients definitely have that, you know, way of thinking, but they think about the world in, in that kind of way. So it's, I think there's a lot more of all the personality. I mean, I don't, I don't know if I would call it a person. I mean, it's technically obsessive compulsive personality disorder, but it's, um, I, I think there's, it's one of the least researched, you know, we mm. have borderline antisocial narcissistic or certainly research more. So I think it, it needs to be researched more because um, I've also worked with people with ADD who can look OCPD, but it's only because they'll tell you, I know what works for me and don't tell me I, I can't be flexible. Like, because it yes, really I, I will, I will say that for myself. Like when I say I look at my calendar about 40 times a day, at, at least like that's because I know how often if I don't, I will completely forget that I have an appointment in an hour or that big project that I need to be, be focusing all my attention on. Absolutely. Like, I'm constantly looking at that. Um, it's like, it, it, I do that to keep sort of rebuffering my RAM in my brain. Yeah. Um, it's, but it's not impairing. I, I, I have, have a separate iPad that I use just for my calendar that stays open all day long. Like, that's not impairing to me. That's functional. That's right. Uh, you know, so when you talk about, like, the, the I know there's certain areas of my sort of how I do productivity and just how I, how I do life, that may be a little rigid. But I yeah. also know that without doing it, like, the consequences of that will be more significant because I've had had a, a lot of evidence, not a one-time thing, a lot of evidence of what happens when I don't do this. Right. And with OCPD, it's actually the opposite, that it, there's more evidence to show that something isn't working. And the person with OCPD has just, even in the face of evidence that's saying people are not responding positively to you or, you know, your health is, is they, they, they can't shift out of that. And, and honestly, a lot of times it's because they feel like they shouldn't, you know, shift out of it. So I never have anyone come into my office saying, I have OCPD, I want help with this. Just like I never have a nar- you know, someone with narcissistic personality say, I'm a narcissist and I want help with this. They, I'll see them because they also have an eating disorder or um, they got fired from a job and they, they don't understand like how someone could dismiss someone who was working 20 hours, you know, a day, you know, who was super productive, that it's almost kind of looking at that bigger picture. Um, but I would, there's um, the IOCDF, that's the International OCD Foundation, they have a great handout on their website about OCPD that really captures to people um, what it is, the kind of how it is different than OCD, how it's wedded to sort of these like uh, perfectionistic beliefs and, and morality often gets into it. Um, that makes it a very different thing than OCD. So when, when OCD and ADHD coexist and the, the content in a sense of the OCD is workaholism, Mm-hmm. And you have someone who maybe owns their own business. This may or may not be about me. Um, what, what do you, you know, what, what do you do? Like, so exposure therapy would say you just force yourself to not work so much? Yeah, well, I guess the first question is how um, are all of your values being, what are your values and are they all being executed? So if I, like work is a very important value to me. I love what I do. My mm-hmm. family is a very important value to me. So if I were working 18 hours a day, I'm, I'm totally getting, fulfilling that value of work, but I'm not fulfilling the value or, or executing in the, uh, you know, bringing to light the value of being with my family. I have a value of self-care is an important value. Um, you know, being my leisure time, music, you know, all of those kind of things are important values. So it's, it's just being aware that 
you know, are all of those things kind of in, in balance? Because with the people with ADD, we do, we're oriented towards that which stimulates us. And yes. oftentimes it could be what's pleasurable, but it could sometimes be just what stimulates us, even if it's anxiety producing, you know, at times. Um, and so it's, it's important to just say, okay, is, let me kind of take stock and be mindful of what my values are. And am I fulfilling kind of all of that? Um, because I know people who enjoy work and they are very good at what they do. And that, you know, again, and it's hard to argue with someone, well, what's like Steve Jobs, you know, is a good example that he was a workaholic. He admitted he was not the best father or the best husband. And that would not be my value system. I, I just, you know, being part of creating the iPhone and everything would not be, would mean nothing to me if mm. my kids didn't say that I was a really good dad. That, mm. that is more important. Now, it's not for me to tell Steve Jobs or to have told him when he was alive, like, hey, you should really pay attention to this. But it is, it would be important if he were sitting in my office or someone like him to say, well, just so you know, as long as you're aware that you're not fulfilling this value with your family, your family is here telling you that you know, they, they miss you or that they don't feel connected to you. And I guess it comes down to the individual to say, how does that sit with them? Because, you know, if, if he, he, what I've heard, I, I didn't read his autobiography, but what I've heard, you know, about it and, and talks that he did, that he was perfectly comfortable with being seen as not the easiest person to get along with if it produced at the end these amazing things that, you know, Apple, you know, was part of producing. Mm. And that was his value system. And so part of this also just comes when you're talking about OCPD, you know, that becomes part of the discussion, which can make it interesting as well, but definitely very different than OCD. So I'm looking at our, our, our time. I know you said you have to, to go at the top yes. of the hour and we are, we are there. So, um, you know, Roberto, I think every time we've talked at the very end of the conversation, we say we got to have you back on to talk about something else. Yes. What else do we want to have you back to talk about? Oh, I can talk about lots of things. Yeah, what haven't we talked about yet? Uh, Substance abuse, um, addiction. I actually treat a number of people with sexual addiction, um, internet addiction, pornography addiction. um, All right, we're going to get one. uh, We're going to have you back to talk about addiction, absolutely, because that's actually an area that we have not explored on the show. Very, very important. Yeah, I see a lot of people with that comorbidity of ADHD and um, various drugs, various substances. and you know, dr- drugs, alcohol, but also things like um, you know, sexual things. Of course, we talk about food and eating disorders, um, but that whole world, I think, is a very important one to address. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you again, Roberto. Always, always a pleasure. Always good talking with you. And where can people uh, find you or reach you uh, if they want to, if they have more questions for you? So I live in the Stone Ages where I don't have a Facebook a website or Twitter yet, although I'm not on the Facebook. <laughs> I'm not on the Facebook, um, <laughs> but I welcome any emails from people and I will respond to them. Uh, my email is Roberto, R-O-B-E-R-T-O underscore Olivardia, which is O-L-I-V-A-R-D-I-A at H-M-S for Harry Mary Sally dot Harvard dot E-D-U. And I welcome any feedback, questions, thoughts that people have. And, and I have to say, Eric, what I love about, I mean, so many things I love about doing these podcasts with you, but I get a lot of really insightful, interesting questions. Um, the one we did on sleep, the one with bipolar disorder that people, um, you know, first it shows how many people are tuning in to your podcast, which is, I think, a fantastic podcast, but people have a lot of, it's clearly something that resonates with people. And so that's what I, I, I just love disseminating information and in, in these conversations. So thank you for having me. And thank you. And we'll get the link to your, your email address on the show notes. Uh, so whatever episode this ends up being, it'll be erictivers.com slash whatever that episode number is. Um, and you can find more information, the, the show notes to, uh, uh, to this episode there. And Roberto, thank you so much. Anytime. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This has been Eric Tivers, and I want to thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find summaries and additional resources for each episode, learn more about the ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group, and more. 
It's all at ADHDrewired.com. Don't just be a passive listener. Be an active member of the community. Submit your request to join our free and growing community on Facebook. Watch for a message from me on Facebook because I screen everyone before they come in the group. Podcasts do change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Share it online or share it with a friend. If you're a member of Chad or any other ADHD support group, let people know about this show. And if you really loved this episode, please hit share on your podcast player. One of the biggest things you can do to support this podcast and help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and a review on iTunes or Stitcher. If you can't figure out how to do it, message me on Facebook or through my website, and I'll be happy to walk you through it. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at Audible by using my affiliate link at audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Not sure where to start? Start with Brene Brown's The Gift of Imperfections or her six-hour recorded workshop, The Power of Vulnerability. This is Eric Tivers reminding you that when you spend time to plan, you will save time 